could have found. Lord, where are we at today? Let's clean up our game jam. <clears throat> nope, let's fix the microphone. There we go. Oh, okay. We are streaming. We are streaming. We have sound. I didn't forget to mute it this time. Ah, okay. So the problem we ran into was we have no kill box for some reason. Even though there's a negative, ooh, I might have put that way too low. That was just silly. What's our Z at? Um, zero. Let's go with negative. And um, I want to roll nine. That was broken. Yeah. Kill Z is not. Let's try this again. And hello to anyone hanging out. I am cleaning up the game jam entry, coding it, coding it, commenting it, cleaning up all the crappy problems. That way I can release the code and do a video on it. Right now I've got a bug with not being able to teleport properly. Which I'll fix after I fix the kill Z problem. Let me make sure this actually works. Or does that kill my player? Yeah, okay, cool. <sighs> yes, once I clean up the code, it will go on my GitHub like everything else. So hopefully it won't take too long to fix the two bugs I care about fixing and go from there. Now, there's an issue with the kill Z, which means my player. So what I need to do is find my character. <sighs> Should be a kill, right? I remember right? Seriously? Wasn't there a default kill one destroyed? Is this it? Funny part is, <clears throat> even though what I'm doing right now will fix this issue, I need to fix the movement itself, and it's going to fix the issue in the first place. But it's still better, as I found yesterday, to make sure you cover all your edge cases, because of the fact that someone managed to actually get out of the level, and then they got stuck. And since I was not... I didn't implement a restart function like I should have. I technically got him stuck for too long. Dead. Okay, cool. So what we need to do is we need to hook up our game framework. Uh, we need to have, um, let's see, check for lose, win or lose. So the easiest way to do this is probably to... Okay. This should be the easiest way of doing this without having to screw up too much. Without having to do too much extra code. Inside of our game mode, we have the check for win or lose. So we could technically run the check for win or lose condition, this. And if we set 
the number of turns. Oh, seriously, can I just type in, here we go. We set the turns left to be zero. That means technically they run out of turns and we should be able to just simply set the turns to zero, check for win or lose, and it should cause them to lose immediately when they die. So this technically should be a fix for a bug that shouldn't happen. But it's better to have this in here just to be safe. And then I'm going to remove the movement code because it is done crappily. It should not be in here. I should not have taken the time to add the movement code half-assed because it caused more issues than it helped. There we go. So that at least takes care of if they fall down. We still have an error, but that's probably because we have no... Yeah, which is fine. It's not going to cause an issue. Yeah, because we're resetting it, so it shouldn't be an issue. Um, that's just basically causing an issue because of the fact that we have no um, player controller, because we've destroyed the player by the time we're trying to disable the input on the controller. So let's fix this. This is one of those other things, if I hadn't have... Right in the beginning, I set my kill Z to a huge amount, just because I thought I might have levels to go up and down. I got ahead of myself, that ended up causing this issue. This is one of those things where if I had simply tested everything, I would have been okay. See if we can fix the cause of this issue, which is my movement code being utter crap. It's this right here. It, it I should not have done this. Let's just re-implement the code that I had before, the initial one. Hopefully right here, this is all going to be bad code. Crappy, uh, why is the comment not working? Oh, there we go. Crappy, broken. So all we need to do is set our actor transform. We're going to the targets or transform. Come on. Set that. It should be the plus. On this, see, this is also another reason to. If you implement a different change, you should. I should have kept the old code, the old movement code right here. If I had kept the old movement code, I could have just basically toggled it back on, and I wouldn't have had an issue. <sighs> yes, I know. Whoops, I know self does not. That's because this is basically broken code. Yeah. Uh, Connected, aren't I? Yeah, no, even then, it's still gonna have an issue. Okay. 
Okay. See if our movement code. Yeah, we've broken our movement code again. It's completely. Platform clicked on. This is the platform I clicked on. Oh, set the actor transform. I need the player, right? Which is my control pawn. I should just set the transform on something. That's funny. There we go. So it's direct movement now. But things like level 9. I should be able to move up directly now without getting stuck. Should be no way to get stuck now if it's done properly. Which means my cheating one right here. Yep, tip. There's no should be no way to get stuck now. Because the fact we're simply moving to the correct position on the new place. Okay. <sighs> so that fixes that one. Now the next question I had was I need to restart in the menu. So let's put in a restart button inside of our menu. So unpause. Let's just rename these. This is going to be quit. So let's throw a copy in here above it, like that. We'll call this one. We'll call this one restart if I find my text. Start. I'll put this back to black. And we'll start this. Maybe a reddish. I'll give it a reddish. There we go. Restart button. Okay. And then we should be able to get oh, not that one. Restart button. Click. And we should be able to call it restart level. Going to be good game. I don't know why this is on the game mode. This this one's always weird to me. Okay. Yep. So that's going to cause an issue. With what? Let's, let's call this, let's do this once so we can get all our code cleared out. We'll move a couple times. Oh, because the stupid UI is probably doing the animation. Okay. So let's see. Check for win or lose. So it's trying to check for win or lose. Oh, crap. <sighs> I want to do this as easy and simple as possible. But I don't think it's that one. Let's try that. Because reset level should just call the reset on everybody, right? Yeah, see, so that's not what we wanted. Why do I have a feeling that one second? Where is my character? I'm curious if this is getting called. Yep. <clears throat> so it's killing the pro player when it resets. Oh, crap. Which is going to call check for win or lose on the start. <sighs> so. Should be an override for on reset. So let's see which one of these gets called first, shall we? Let's 
It's gonna destroy it. Yep, okay. So we need to have some way of Okay, you know what? If we get rid of this, we shouldn't need it anymore. So we basically implemented a fix for something we won't need. Okay, so that, there we go. So, reset, should not need anymore due to having reset and fixing movement. At least it's in there now, okay. So that should be it. Now I can go through and code everything, clean up the code, so that way I can release it. So this is just a lot of going back and fixing stupid stuff to give text like that. Okay. And this code is obviously incorrect now. Um, allow mouse look up, down. Let's move some stuff around. This is rotating the camera, so put those together. This code is setting the text for our player, so we learned already not to delete sh stuff. Um, update the text render of the player to show their name. So this is disabled because we're not doing anything. Set our initial camera pitch of the player. So this is our begin play event. This is going to be our kill player event. Clean up our code here. Handle the player being killed. Let's say spawn, spawn our death emitter. And kill our player. Okay. And then this is gonna be let's see. Oops, I moved something. There we go. So we have seems technically disabled. So we're gonna move our two disabled codes technically near each other like this. Other code like this. Have our movement code there. There we go. So that's code. That's good. We have nothing else in our event graph. So we can consider our character cleaned up. Here's our controller. This should already be coded because we pulled this in from somewhere else. So we should be good there. Let's see. Interfaces, we don't need to comment. This is our old character. We don't need, but I'll keep it in there. Here's my mesh. Okay, so everything in the character folder is done. Here's our framework. We'll add in a comment because we can. Just all of our variables. Let's see. Store our player name. The level. Level names. Level names. Oh my gosh. Names. Level we are on. I hate. So annoying. I give me the bigger stupid no, okay. My level we're on and if we are here. Now we at least have a comment in here. And good morning, James. Okay, here's where most of our code is gonna go. How much of this do we have coded already? It's a good question. This is handling toggling the music. Turn the music on. Is it on already? If it is, if not, create our sound component and play our sound. I'll take let's play our music. 
And this one is if we tell it to stop, stop. This is actually bad code. We should have the same thing here. Because we happen to tell it to stop when it's not already there, and then we tell it to stop a component that doesn't exist, it's going to lead into an issue. So we'll do there we go. Um, turn this on. Not copy at all, please. Thank you. And if we do, I'm gonna go ahead and stop. Stop the music. Valid, uh, technically set up. Yeah, validate our audio. Okay. Audio stuff is good. <clears throat> Handle clicking our finishing platform. Loop through all of our visible platforms. Why am I even doing this? Because, because probably for safety's sake, just because of the fact that we're already there. Oh, I need to clean up this code. Damn it. Hello, Shlom. Throw this code in here because I know this is. Wait a few seconds. Okay, this is gonna be set our. That would be not gonna set our layer to the new platform. Okay, so question here is: What is an efficient way of getting our Stuff not to look as ugly. I need the same code more than once. Technically, this needs to go here, 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 and here. These will need to get moved up, which means these need to get moved down like that. That'll have to be up here. This will have to be there. Roughly like that. Our roots still gonna have to come in. So our roots gonna come in from below is what we're gonna do. Okay. So we're gonna clean this up by doing this. That's what we're gonna do. There we go. And then I can pull that off of there. We can technically do this to clean that up a little bit. This one over. Move our array up here. Move this code out. Do that. There we go. So that's a little cleaner. We're going to compare here. We're going to. We can move this over now, like that. One of these got moved the wrong way. is such a weird game. What the 
tail is Frenching the fries. There we go. That's at least nothing overlapping, which is what I care about. Uh, let's see, did you ever use a video? Oh my gosh, okay. So, um, thanks for the tutorial on the name system. I love it. I'm um, glad it helped. Quick couple of questions. Where are the relative position of where I want to move something in front of the first person's camera? And how do I effectively cast to get the variable I set up in the first person blueprint? There's no socket in the first person blueprint option, so I use a cube as a dummy socket. What you would use is a transform if you're looking to get something. It would technically it's a scene component. Uh, okay, let's... Let's go to our character. Okay, so here's our character. And you're trying to move something in front of the first person's camera. So, assuming this is the camera here, you want to add a scene component underneath the camera. A scene component is basically just a transform. That's basically what it is. That's how you attach things, or you do things relatively. So this scene component, for example, is right in front of the camera. Let me zoom out a little bit. Zoom. There we go. So it's right here in front of the camera. Or I could move it. Oh, my snap was a lot lower. Anywhere. So this is how I'd set something physically to be in front of my camera. So I'd position it wherever I want, and it's going to be in that position at all times, wherever the camera moves, because it's a child. And if you want to move it, you move it relative to its parent. So if you want to move it, for example, let's let's click on our camera. Let's focus on our camera, let's rotate back, and let's say we are looking out of our camera right now. Uh, like this. So we're looking out of our camera. If we want to move our scene component to the left, it's we move it negative y relative to the parent. So if you move it in the world, you can move it anywhere. If you move it relative to the parent, our current position right now is 0, 0, 0 relative to the parent. So we move it left or right relative. These values are relative, you can see right here. If we have it world, or it's our absolute location, it's going to be completely different. Which is not what we want. We want to make sure we're using relative if you want to do it relative to the thing above it, which is the parent. So if you want something uh, socketed, basically do it like that. Your camera, a, a scene component underneath it. You could call this the... Um, um, you know, item attach point, for example. And then you put your other item under that. Or you just put your other item under that, because your other item more than likely has its own transform, which means you just move the other item relative under the camera. Um, so, hopefully that answered something. Um, do you ever use a video as a background for a game menu? Um, I have not. You'd have to use a media player, which is something I just learned how to use the other day. Um, get something to that spot, basically attaching something from the world, not in the blueprint. Which, well, okay, you you need to actually detail what you're trying to do to see if it's so I can understand better. I think is what it is. But having a transform, basically an attach point, a scene component underneath the camera, at least gives you something in your camera relative to your camera for attaching to or for moving relative. Um, so technically, if you have something outside of your scene, like let's say, for example, you had a, a cube in your scene and you want that to be in front of your camera at a certain point, then you would move it relative to the world. You would grab the, um, you'd grab your blueprint, grab that point in here, whatever you called it, in front of your camera, get its world location. Yeah, um, okay, give me a sec. I don't understand. Um, okay, 
yeah. The because um, while this transform that I've removed here, the sync component is relative to the camera. You want to physically know where in the world it is, so you know where in the world you physically do it. Hopefully that's enough of, hopefully that is the basic. Um, if you need a little more help, I can show you how to do it after I finish cleaning up the code, because it's really simple. It's really simple in theory, I should say. So. Yeah, okay. So we've got a platform to move to, uh, move ought, move to. Um, if it is, set our player to the new platform, wait a few seconds, check if we won or lost, okay. So that grouping should be done. This pulses the visibility of our platforms. This, let's see. Oh, uh, steady. Which is kind of funny, this comment is basically redundant because I named the function uh, well enough. Um, create our game UI add to the screen. Make sure make sure our UI is gone. Um, well, yeah, I do, but I have the rotational part as part of that tutorial, for the, the lookout part, basically. And the lookout part is what was going to take most of the work, so I haven't done any research on that yet. Okay, crappy broken movement code. Here we go. Well, this is going to be move our char character to the new platform. Let's see. Uh, set our character to the location of the platform plus 33 on the seat. Move a turn. Loop through our current physical platforms. Uh, hide all our current physical platforms. See, I've got something else I'm trying to read right now. Sorry about this. Um, okay. Uh, uh, let's let's unuglify as much code as this as we can. These ones are a giant pain in the butt. See, something like this. Um, okay, you know what? See, something like this would be perfect for a macro. Just so the code isn't as ugly. Get new. Uh, get get new location. Let's see. Get adjusted. Adjusted. Not adjust. Adjusted. Seriously, four times. There we go. And the nice thing is we can go in here and our output, and we can reorganize our output. We'll move this one up like that. So now we've got everything at least in the same order like that. 
That's actually what we probably should have done. Um, where that other giant monstrosity was, this one, we probably should have condensed it as well. Actually, we can, I don't know why I literally just said that, because of the fact we can just copy that macro over now. So, um, yeah, I can go back up here. This is the same, wait, we're getting a root. So we're getting the world transform on a scene component, right? Is that what we're doing over here before I screw myself? Target a scene component, world transform, yeah. So we're getting the world transform on a scene component. So I can reuse this code right here and go lots of deletes, lots of deletes, lots of deletes. Uh, grab our macro, get adjusted, new location, put it into there, plug our X, Y, and C. And actually, um, I can do this even better. What we can do is. Vector like that, and that returns back a vector. Unplug the three of these. This one's obviously not the right one there. Here we go. See, if you can consolidate things, it's the best as possible. There we go. Grab our output, get rid of all of these. Uh, transform. Turn this into a transform. Split our transform. Okay, split it. There we go. Plug in that, that, and that. Now our output's a transform. Now we can recombine these three like that. Make sure, uh, we're gonna make sure our scale is one. Cause that we want, there we go. So now I've turned that giant monstrosity into a nice, happy little single node. Then we'll go down here and fix this one, wherever I broke it at. Right here, right? No, right here. There we go. Combine these back. There we go. That's some nice code cleanup there. There's a good use for a macro right there. <sighs> okay. Okay, good. Um I've got some questions. I see that. Give me a second. Let me let me finish commenting this up. And then I'll see what we have. Remove turn, loop through everything we are visible. This thing needs to, um, let's see, this is the completed, so we'll move this one over. What's an easy way to make this not totally screwrific? I guess like that, there we go. Move these things down, move these things down. That one there, oh, those are up too high. Look down one. That move this one to here. There we go. Then this stuff should be here, and then this one should be here. There we go. So we got that a little bit cleaner now. Uh, make sure these are set properly. Let's see. Uh, look for any platforms around us, and we're going to. Loop, loop through all the platforms around us. Break this into a part. We're going to toggle visibility on all those. Turn on any platforms near us. And then once we're done, check for win or lose. Check for win or lose. Lose. There we go. We don't need to say it's moving anymore because we no longer do that. That was this retarded broken code up here, which I'm actually going to color this oh, like a red so we know it's crappy, broken, and we don't want to use it anymore. We'll move it off to the side if I can get it in the right spot. There we go. So this one's still good. Let's move this over here. Was oh, there any more code hiding? Okay, so there's nothing in here. I still got to code these, but let's see what we got for questions. 
Um, yes, James, I did get that email. Thank you very much. That is a um, interesting way of doing it in the material. That's one nice thing is you have multiple ways of doing things. Screamhouse Games. How do you create a static minimap that tracks the player's translation and rotation, but does not rotate or translate the minimap itself? Uh, great tips and tutorials anyways. Well, the minimap itself shouldn't be rotating unless you don't, unless you, um... Okay, so, I mean, you have a minimap, and the minimap's going to be a widget or something, I'm assuming, and it's going to show something. And then somewhere on there, you're going to have something else that represents the player, their location, and their rotation, I'm assuming. So, the minimap itself shouldn't rotate or move if i mean it rotate it shouldn't rotate or move um i've never created a minimap system beyond just a simple overhead camera system as in you just take a render tar you look down with a separate camera and have the, that camera's view up in the corner and you're basically looking from above and then i mean your camera doesn't move it doesn't rotate um let's see i guess if your your minimaps camera is technically fixed to the player and the player rotates and I could see how the ca the minimap would rotate so the easiest way on that one is you just have a camera not maybe maybe your camera your minimap um camera yeah, I don't know how you're doing your minimap but if you're using a camera to do it just like for an overhead view maybe you have it attached to the player which you shouldn't have it as its own separate object to just track the player manually then if the player rotates, it really doesn't matter. You're just, trans you're just tracking the location. Uh, if you have more information on how you're doing it, maybe I can see if I have any ideas. Okay. Uh, in our setup, be from the level, and how many turns? There we go. So that one's done. Show how many turns left. Set our player's name and play and animation when the player moves. News showing showing the new turns left. There we go. Yeah, um, so you're using a camera, but is your camera, for example, part of your player? If it is, that's going to air inherit the rotation for the most part. If it's not part of your player, which is what I'd recommend, then it's not going to inherit the rotation. It's just going to basically be wherever you want. Just have it separate is the easiest way of doing it. It's its own blueprint on the player movement, have it update the camera item, or every tick, have the camera update itself to where the player's at. Um, or if you're, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I could show something like that if I can remember how to do multiple camera views. I've never, I don't think I've ever used render targets, but, um, just let me know based on the information I have if that kind of maybe helps the right direction. If not, let me see what I can do after I um, remember what I was doing in the first place. Oh, this one. Here we go. Um, and then pulse view. Oh, look at that code. And the funny part about this is this code right here is technically the same code we have right here. So this would be a good place to, let's see if it is good. Let's see if it's the same. And then here we go. Oh, it would have been smarter to do this on the top. There we go. Okay. So this code is what I'm looking at right here against this code right here. Do we have the same code? 0.01 pulse multiplier, which is passed in get player controller, get controlled pawn, uh, and then outputs a visible platform array. So if I was to put this into a macro with an input, 
This is going to be our base pulse radius. Or, okay, yeah. So let's see if we can macro this efficiently, shall we? We're going to take this. We're going to macro it down. It will have one input. And where's our macro? Okay, I'm your macro. The input is going to be the um, uh, pulse radius. There we go. And then we'll have to reorganize this stuff. This has got to be more Banjo Kazooie. There we go. Okay, and that's going to output an array of hits. Okay. So what do we want to call this one? We want to call this one Get Visible Platforms. Oh wait, no, not get visible platforms. Get um, uh, where what was it right here? Uh, set visible platforms. Yeah, set visible platforms. There we go. So, oop. look at all that code. Look at that code condensed. There we go. Actually, this whole damn section right here could probably be. Huh. You know what? I bet you this. Okay. And then this does the output. Okay. So we're good there. Which means this code right here, this entire section here, up to the. Oh, you can't. Yeah. Okay. So this would have to have an output on the. I wonder if I can have an output on. If I collapse the whole thing. Ah, screw it. I don't want to. You know what? I don't want to. I'm just going to get rid of this stuff. Set visible platforms. Oh, it's all ugly again. Base pulse radius and that. And look at that. Reasonable code. That's the way we like it. Okay. Let's see. Find and set our platforms that will become visible okay so we need to do this one um, this one is fine set our platform this is a good spot in case you were noticing to condense a lot of code technically this code all right here the exception of the output it's the same code here, and it should be condensed. You can have another execute outwire for the completed, but I'm not going to to worry about that. Call it. There we go. Loop through our soon to be this this loop through our clo nearby nearby platforms. And then make them make make them visible. Okay. Oh, that wraps up that one. That should be wrap up the game mode, right? Yep. Okay. Game mode's wrapped up. Level set up. This just simply holds crap. Holds holds the number of turns. For the level and let the player set it in the print in the scene. So that one's done. This is a BPI game. Okay, so those ones are done. Let's see, we'll go back to questions. Uh, I use this tutorial as a base that used the camera and then a throbber for the player position. Yep, I've seen that one before. Let me quickly scan through that one.
Yep, that looks familiar like one I've seen before. Now the problem you're having is it's rotating when you rotate? Or what's the problem that you're having here? Because it looks like it's a fixed camera. Let's see. Yeah, you're setting up a texture can't can't yeah from the render blah 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 blah. Yeah, placed directly above the level. Um Okay. If that's a fixed camera above the level in its own blueprint, isn't it? Let's see. Um I'm pretty sure it is. So is the problem that your camera is moving when the player moves? Because I don't think it's set to uh, get all actor, mini cam, loop through, uh, loop. There's your outside. Yeah. Okay. So is this thing set to tick on the move? Let's see. Get player pawn. Get the player's rotation, set the render angle. Maybe it's, um, maybe it's the rotation that you're doing. Yeah. Uh, let's see, that's the throbber. Well, it's, um, uh, pretty, yeah, it's going to, um, but you just want, okay, I'll, I'll have to look at that Scream House. I don't think I can help with that right now. Um, I'd have to try to recreate it. Give me, give me a little bit. If you hang, if you're still on when I'm on, I've still got a little over an hour. Um, if you're still on, we'll see if I can help with that directly. But for now, um, uh, I got to finish this project up first. Um. Yeah, and Van Gold, yeah, that's an idea that would probably work as well. He's using a um, a wiki entry for it, and it looks like it should work fine, but it's rotating the render angle, basically, of the widget based on the actor's rotation. And it sounds like that's technically what he wants, but it's... But it's not. Anyways, I'll I'll look at that in a bit. Let me let me see what I got here. Oh, there's more code. Let's see. So what do we got here? We have um, our wisp moving increment. How long we been moving for? Oh, hey, there goes the code. This is the um, set our location to based on set our location on the spline based on how long we have been alive and how long we want to be alive. Ooh, that's some silly words there. Oh, that works. Um, are we done? Are we at the end? You know, I probably should have left this thing delay for a little bit. No, it's on the tick. That won't work. I could have just basically told it to do nothing. Um, stop our wisp. Destroy the emitter. Destroy our emitter. Uh, I didn't use this code, so I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that, because I never used that code. I was going to have the end platform disappear when we got to the end on the last level only, but that would have been really mean. Move our wisp if we need to move.
Yeah, no, Scream House, there are a couple people in chat who may be able to help you as well. Maybe if you clarify... You did follow this example, but maybe clarify exactly what you're looking for. Like, does the map show the entire level? Or just the portion around your player? Is the map going to stay in one corner of the screen? Which I'm assuming, yes. If the player was to be looking up or north or vertically and on the map, basically up on the map, and they were to turn around... Is the map going to rotate so that way the player is basically always facing north? Or does the map stay static and then the player basically looks like they're looking down now? Uh, those are a couple of things that might help give us some clarifications here. Turn on our wits. Spawn, spawn our nigger. There we go. And this is our timeline, which we never use, because we did it in the tick. And that should be the entire wisp. Okay, so our wisp is done and coded. These are our power-ups, which... Oh, yay, I coded them already. This is our, this is our character. We touched. Touch, touch us. Use the mouse, thank you. Play us a sound. Spawn a pickup effect. And turn on <laughs> on the pickup effect. Tell our game mode our new multiplier flyer and kill ourselves. Destroy ourselves. Ourselves? Destroy ourselves. Probably ourselves, right? Destroy ourselves. There we go. And this one's simply. Oh, which we already have in here. Already have it. Okay. So our power up's done. Here's our platforms. Yeah, it's not too bad. Pulse the. Material when plus the material. That's all I'm really gonna do. Let's begin play. This is gonna be um, turn ourselves off on begin play and create our material instance so we can pulse. Begin play should be at the top. Oh, this is on debug. Why is it on debug? Uh, uh, so I have watch turned on, and I don't remember how I did that. Huh. Ah. Okay, so... Let's see, um... Prevent, print, double clicks. Tell, tell our game mode we were clicked on. Allow ourselves to be clicked on again in a second. Which is all this one. Reset. Our, uh, allow ourselves to ourselves to put on again. Handle being put on. Hey, this is ugly. So we have. Same thing going multiple times. I think I can clean this up a little better. So let's clean up the top branch. There we go. So um, we need to be visible. So turn ourselves 
Invisible. Make visible. Okay. Are we cheating? Are we cheating? Because we are cheating, we don't want to shut off our visibility. Cheating. Uh, turn off visibility. Yeah, see, that's a little bit cleaner. Clean up that okay, and then allow ourselves to be clicked on. Uh, wait, this one's gonna be allow ourselves. Uh, let's see. turn off the ability to click on us. There we go. Okay. And then this one's new visibility, which is here. This one's there for cheating or not. So I can pull these back a little bit. Oh, seriously? So I have these backwards, that's funny. Uh, or, I knew the code looked weird. Turn on or off. Are we turning on? There we go. We are turning on visibility. Did I break this code somehow? I'm very curious if I accidentally broke it. Hmm. Ah. <sighs> um. Yep. Will you ever do any shows with the Steam? Arc. I might at some point, but I have no plans on it. Yeah, I figured it was the STK. Um, I might, but I know that the basic Steam stuff is integrated a lot more into the later versions of UE4. Um, I will probably do something when I get to doing multiplayer stuff. Oh, okay, okay. No, I remember read this one already. Um, never mind. I figured out my code. Is cheating already turned on? Yeah, then we're going to need to be visible. And this one is, are we cheating? If we are cheating, then we're going to go ahead and do it no matter what. We don't want visibility. We still want some touch on it. And then talk about visibility. There we go. Okay. Let's see. Handle toggling. See. See, this is why you should always code comment stuff when you're coding. So when you come back later and future you goes, what the hell did you do? You understand at least. 
instead of having to step through it again because you were coding at one in the friggin' morning. 12, 12.30 in the morning or so for that one. False. Material. Mouse over. Okay. So that one should be done. Our platform should be done. Our dummy platform doesn't do anything. Our finished platform is really simple. Okay. Because we don't have to worry about um, cheating with the end platform, it'll always be on. Set our new visibility. Set our new collision. Oops, that was too many things selected there. Um, handle being clicked on. Allow ourselves to be clicked on again. See, and most of this code I could have duplicated if I'd done a parent platform, which is probably something I should have learned. It's really because then I could have just checked to see what class I was and then called the appropriate regular clicked on or finished clicked on. And I would not have had to duplicate a lot of this code. But when you're screwing off, that's something that you'd optimize on a real game. This is not something you'd optimize on a game jam. And most of the time people would jam, learn what they can learn, and then just discard the code. But since I'm tossing this out, uh, pulls all three of our platform objects. Yeah, since I'm giving the code out, I at least want to make this as clean as and readable as possible. Let's see. Um, we can play, create our three uh, dynamic materials for our platforms and set collision to ignore on the middle. I have no idea. I want to shoot those. That's right. Let's see. Create three dynamic materials for platforms to click to ignore. Oh, in the middle. That one didn't feel right. There we go. Well, that's still not right. There we go. Uh, prevent clicking more than once. Turn on our particle system. So the game mode we are we have been on and then allow ourselves to be clicked on the game is second. Which is kinda silly because you beat the game anyways, there's no reason for that to happen. But consistency. Start platform, this one's super simple. When we are hit, the player landed on us at the start. Fire off our free our wisp. Bum, 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 bum. Is the player? Yes, that is the player. Both surrounding platforms. Get our wisp, get any of our wisps. For each wisp, um, activate our wisp. And when we're done, turn on our awesome music. Bam, that one's done. Interfaces, materials, nothing there. Oh, looks like we only have left our UI stuff. Which, I don't really need to code most of the UI stuff. Uh, activate the 
game over animation game over fade in handle restart button handle fix button bum 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 let's see these are bent graphs these are easy enough see since these are all Verbose, they barely need commenting. Handle setting the terms left UI element. Handle setting the player name element. And then randomly pick a pick a name from our list or the player's chosen name. Pause menu. Let me restart button. And hit button. Handle our player choosing to cheat. We are cheating for each platform on the level. If it's not a dummy platform, tell the platform we are cheating. Okay. Now this is handling our pause button when the screen and keyboard is pressed. So we're good there. This is kind of not lined up. Start screen. Hey, look, I coded. Name entry, start the next level, start the UI. You win screen, same stuff. Let's see. Um, start the animation for the you win. And off the player clicking the X level button. Let's see. Set our next level to the current level plus. Next level from our level name array. That's close enough. Okay, and then one more it looks like, and then I'm da 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 da. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that should be all my code. I can go ahead and. This is st seriously, I got rid of you already. Oh, friggin' redirectors. Yes, I already got rid of you, so go away. There we go. Okay, that should be it. I can go ahead and comment and record and release that later. Let's go ahead and update the source code. <sighs> I don't see what I've missed in the meantime. Let's see, this is going to be the 1.1 version of the source. Updated from entry with comments and cleaned up bugs. So I'll be able to push this over to the GitHub repo later today. Oh, okay, so what did I miss? Um, Steam and such. Import a texture like a leaf. Uh, yeah, like, like has already been mentioned, it should be uh, pretty self-evident you just grab yourself an image p 
PNG or Targa, usually a Targa, I believe, for stuff like that, and then just import it. If I had images to import, I'd go into here, like here's, you know, uh, a picture, and then that's it. You just import, click on your picture, and it's in here. Depending on what the picture is, do I have the wrong stream name for today? Probably. I need to update the picture. But depending on the type of picture, you'll have to change these settings. Um, that's it. I mean, it's that's it. Just make sure if it's a Targa, you have an alpha channel. Or if it's a PNG, you have an alpha channel. Because I'm assuming you're going to have alpha on the outside of the um, leaf for the transparency. Um, Your leaf was great, but your ground was scratched. I'd have to get a little more info on that. Uh, tips for multiplayer games. Don't do a multiplayer game until you know how to do a single player game well. That's my first tip and only real tip. Other than that, I've never done multiplayer. I plan on doing it hopefully this month slash next month. I wish I could give you more. Um, look for the Cedric. I mean, the, the other one is... Um, Multiplayer U4. Right here. If you Google Cedric Multiplayer UE4, you should have the UE4 Compendium by Cedric. And this thing is fantastic for learning the basics of how multiplayer works in UE4, how things are related to each other, and how to do stuff. This is like what I'd highly recommend reading over the entire thing before you do multiplayer. Um, I can actually put the link in here, can't I? There we go. I'd highly recommend that for multiplayer. That's actually my other tip. Um, I saw your question, James. Give me a second. Uh, yeah, that, that document is Friggin fantastic for learning the basics of multiplayer. Okay, so for... This is one of the things I said I would try to work on here. Um, I gotta stop, like, actually naming these things. Um, attach to camera. While new level. We have our first person. What am I using for my character? I'm using, like, no one for my character, am I? find my um you know what let's not use the playground let's use the um fps line trace no i, I plan on reading that in a second there james i like figuring out stuff okay so i should have <sighs> swear to god i'm trying to make the cleanest test project for this possible. Okay. While new level, if we hit play, there we go. We have our first person character, because that was the thing. Uh, going good in metric. How's everything going there? So we have a new level here. Let's make ourselves a new content folder. We'll call it test content. And Let's make ourselves a blueprint, and we'll call this one a um, BP pickable, pick, 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 pick upable. That's a crappy name. Object. Oh my gosh. Oh, let's slap it into our scene. Let's open him up. And this, let's say, it would be a cube. So um, let's just make the cube as the root, and make it easier. That's all gonna be a big old cube too. So we'll go with like 0.3. Uh, we'll go like that. So here's our little cubey dude and we want to be able to interact with him and put it um, uh, on our camera is our goal. So let's find our first person blueprint. Let me copy my character over so that way I don't screw with him. Let me make a new game mode so I don't screw with that. This will be the uh, test 
mode. This will be our test character. Open up our game mode. Where's our stupid character? Default pawn class, there we go. Test character. Save that. Let's go to our map and save our map. Test map. Let's go into our test map. World settings. Let's make sure it's set to our test game mode. Now this probably won't work. No good, they fixed it in 414. Okay, so we have our test character we can play with here. Oh, gotcha. There's no texture from the bottom. Yeah, you need two-sided in the material. That, yeah, that would be exactly what you need. So let's find a... Um, let's find a material in here. There we go. So here's a material, and um, in your materials... Oh, I'm in a stupid... Um, oh, I'm not in the material. Dang it. Material layers. Seriously, can I not just have a simple material to screw with? Okay, so in here, you're, what you're looking for is the two-sided option right here. Just type in TWO, or you can scroll down to material, which is in here somewhere. Uh, it should be at the top, right? Yeah, here we go. Two-sided. And what that'll do is it will, like it says, basically flip it, so that way it's uh, going to render on both sides. And you need to do that for things where you're going to render on two sides. Because you got to keep in mind most meshes are just external facing. Internally it's empty. It's hollow. There's no normals. There's no any of that stuff. So turn on two sided and that should fix your leaf from having only one side. It's under material, in your material for the leaf, two sided. So this is our game mode, so we're good there. That's our pickable, upable object. So let's see if we can do a, um, okay, let's, let's see how stupidly stupid we can do this. So I like doing stupidly stupid stuff. How would I do this the easy way? Pick up a bowl. <laughs> That's not a source, pick up a bowl. I'm gonna make an interface called pick up a bowl, which doesn't gonna have anything in it. And uh, that was not the right interface. There we go. I didn't even spell it right. <sighs> there we go. So now this one implements pick up a bowl. And our character has a metric butt ton of stuff here. Oh, because I've already been screwing with stuff, but this is not the one other one. Okay. So we've already got a line trace in place because I've been screwing with things. So let's line trace for. Um, let's do. A, let's just do a line trace. We don't need. Let's do by channel. Let's do it like that. We'll just do a line trace by channel. Oops. There we go. And this is going to be. Let's see. My world location is my start. That's my end. Let's make sure we can see it. We don't need this. Now in theory, uh, let's unhook all the other stuff. Here we go. When we fire, we should at least have a line trace. There we go. So we've got a line trace now. And that's hitable. Hit, hitable. If we hit something, we would go to here. If we implement interface, pick up a bull, we will go from there. Uh, all of these things are completely not needed for this crap. There we go. We don't need that. So. Oops. There we go. So we are going to, if we hit something that's correct, we're going to, so we're going to want to grab the actor and we're going to set the tr world transform of the actor, which of course is not going to cooperate. Uh, cause this is an actor. So we need to do the actor transform is what we need to do. Transform, set actor. Uh, we'll just do the location for now. You should technically set the tr location and the rotation so it faces the camera. We'll just go with this. This is inside of our player. So let's find our, let's get rid of our VR stuff because we don't need our VR stuff. And let's actually get rid of our gun because we don't need our gun. 
there we go. So we have our first person camera. I broke stuff. Uh, let's see. This is our VR stuff we don't care about. What else did I break? Uh, oh, that's probably VR, so I don't care about that either. Okay, we have our little dude and our little dude can fire still. So we're good. And I just set the location to somewhere that doesn't exist. Uh, right in the middle of the world. Okay, where did our character go? Uh, over here, right? Okay, so if this is the proper thing we want to hit, we want to get our first person camera. We're going to add scene component to it on our camera. We're going to call this one our um, pick upable anchor. And we're going to get world location of the scene component, plug that in find our pickable anchor and let's set it like that there we go so now it will move it to wherever the anchor is relative to my camera now if you want to actually anchor there that's where you're going to kind of have an issue um well the pick upable is the group it the pick uh, the pick upable is a blueprint I mean, it's right there. So my pick up of bull is a blueprint. It's not just a cube in the scene. But the problem you're gonna have is whether or not you want to attach it. Now, if you're just going to do something like looking, it's not much of an issue because I'm assuming that once you like activate the object, it comes closer and then you no longer can like move your character. Pull this in a little bit. See? And that just brings it. That's technically, you're looking at it, you click on it, it brings it up to your camera and it locks it to this location. It moves it to this location. And that one's just by um, uh, basically using a set actor location node. The target's going to be your hit on your line trace. So it's going to be my blueprint. And the Location is going to be the world location of my anchor, which is attached to my camera. Um, the pickable object is just simply a cube inside of a blueprint. It could be whatever you want. Hopefully that's the basics of helping you understand how to get something to move somewhere. We're basically setting the world location of this actor to the world location of where this anchor is. And this anchor is always going to be attached to our camera. And it's always going to be at that position in front of our camera. Uh, you want to attach. Now, so does that mean you, if like, for example, I clicked on that and now I start moving around, it's gonna be in front of me at all times? Like I'm over here and it's in front of me. And I'm over here and it's in front of me. And while you do that, let's see what else we get. Um, yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, okay, two-sided work for that. Uh, looks good. And I think I got the basis of that. Okay, so you want it to be stuck to the front. This is going to use, actually, <laughs> what's funny about that is what you need to know are the transform nodes here. And... These ones are the ones I haven't covered yet. I've covered half of them. This is rather half I haven't covered. This is actually what I'm gonna be working on over the next three weeks. And these ones, attached to actor, attached to component, actor and scene component. These are the ones that are going to be needed in order to do what you wanna do. So, let's see. What we want to do is, and keep in mind, I have not done this in a while. Yeah, I, I have a feeling I would be doing this a different way, but I want to see if I can do it this way. I don't think I can but I'm curious if I can. 
So we want to attach this to the component. We want to make sure it's a scene component. Yeah, because we want... Whoa, that would be me dragging, trying to drag over to the details panel. We want this to be the anchor. We don't need a socket. Its target is going to be scene component reference, which is going to be... Get root component. Yeah, I don't expect this to work, by the way. I'm definitely curious if it's going to. Well, it worked. Because if you look, you can actually see the shadow. I just don't actually know where it ended up. <laughs> oh, okay. Let's see if we can figure this out, shall we? Because it, it's here somewhere. I can see the shadow. Yeah, see, okay, so you can attach it. There we go. Its location got, ooh, look at that. Its location got all funkified. So we don't actually need to do this if we're attaching. What we want to do is this. There we go. Okay. Whoop, I just pushed me. You probably want to turn off collision. Oh, gosh. You'd probably want to turn the collision off on this as well. After, uh, when you attach it. Because it's causing some serious issues when I do that. Oh. Uh, okay, so here's what, here's what happened the first time. Basically, I was moving the location, which was good. But the problem was once I attached it, it inherited the location. And that's what put it somewhere else. So what I'm doing here is basically setting this location to nothing because remember we're going to want it relative to our anchor and we're going to want it at zero on the anchor. We're going to want it right where the anchor is. And then I attach it. I use an attach to component. I grab the root of the thing I'm hitting, which is the target, and I tell it to use the pickup anchor as the parent. And then everything else, see like some of these you could change, like if I hadn't have set this. I could probably like screw with some of these options, but you know, this is the easiest way of just making it work for now. The issue I have now is that. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, I have collision turned on that item while it's attached to me. And as you can see, it's causing overlapping issues with myself. So, What we could do is probably do this, grab the anchor, get the child, child. We should only have one child. Seriously? Oh, cause I used the wrong, okay. So um, obviously don't use the panel one, use the component one. Let's see, so get, get child component of the pickable anchor. Here we go. There was one I already had plugged in. So this will give me the first one. It should give us only the item we're adding onto there. And we'll do set the collision, which of course you should, uh, shit, it's a scene component. Well, we, we should be able to cast this to a pickable object. Pick, pick, to pick. What in the hell did I call it? Pick upable object. Yeah, why wouldn't it let me cast to a pickable object? Uh, because it's a scene component? Oh, because technically then it would be a component that I'm attaching. So it would be a, oh, see, this is, I've not done much with attaching. Okay, so let's do this. Let's grab it. Let's break out. Let's look at this. Okay, so it is a test character. On there we have a pickable anchor attached to that pickable anchor so it's attached to us. So actually, technically, this is attaching to us, it looks like. It looks like it's attaching to the character. So maybe I'm going about this wrong. So, um, hold on a second.
Okay, in theory, I'm back. Is the headset still working? Yeah, there we go. Um, keep in mind, this is not the way I would do this, by the way. I would do it a completely sort of different way, which I'll cover in a second. But I'm curious to see how to get this working. Because, um, I mean, once you attach, attach this component to another scene component, optionally the name socket. Um, so how do I get the item that's attached? Uh, well, let's see if we type in attach. There we go. Get attach. Get attached actors. Okay, let's see if this returns anything, shall we? We will get the length of the attached actors. Okay. One. Okay, so it's the attached actors. Here we go. So we want this. We'll get our first item. This will give it back to an actor. Now we should be able to cast this to the pickable object. There we go. Actually, I wonder if I can set the collision. No, okay, I didn't think so. There we go. So, do 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 set collision. Uh, do do do. Let's see. Collision response to all channels queue. Let's get rid of that. That set to ignore. Okay, let's see if it fixes that wonky issue. There we go. So now we have an item that's not going to completely screw us. That's permanently attached as long as we don't jump off. Now, if you want to get rid of it, we um. <sighs> Again, this is not the right way. This is not the way I would do this. We already know. The nice thing is, we don't. We already uh, words fail. English not good. We already know if this is not equal to zero. For example, we have something attached. We have something attached. So in our spawning, which is now not technically called spawning, it's the line trace thingy. If we basically have something attached, our length is. Uh, uh, we gotta do length then. Length is greater than zero. This means we have something already attached. So if we have something that we don't have anything attached, we're gonna go ahead and do our line trace. So we can take our code, we'll take all of our code, move it out of the way, take all of this code here rid of our comment box, drag it down, and that should be the code when we have something attached. So now if we if we don't have something attached. Now if we have something attached, we know it's here. We know we can get it. And can we unattach is the question. Un, uh, would, maybe it's called remove? No. Uh, Remove from parent. Let's see. Components. Okay, so get attached actors is under what section? It is under utilities transform. So we want to be able to unattach. We'll be parented to a new item. That doesn't make sense. Okay, let's go into our palette. That way it's easier. Let's see. So, do, 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 do. Technically, that would be... Cons no, it's still another item. So, utilities. Transform. Detach. Did I just see... Yep, detach from actor. There we go. Ah, I found the word detach. So, we want to detach this from the actor. And I have no idea what's going to happen when we detach. So let's find out. So grab it, click the button, detach. And let's go back to editing here. So it is part of our character now. When we click the button, it's now detached. It is here somewhere. Eject. Pick up. Oh, yeah, so it went to zero, zero is where it went to, I would assume, right? Yeah, okay, so when, and it, that makes sense because it's set to zero, zero when it's attached to the player. 
So that makes sense. So ba -ba -ba, let's try detaching from the player. Let's try getting our anchor. So uh, get world location of our anchor. We're going to set the location. Shit, let's see. It's no longer attached, which means I have to do it here, I think. I think I have to do it before I detach. I think I need to detach as the last thing. So let's move this down, and we're going to set world. Okay, that's ah, not going to work. Set location. Yeah, let's see, so this is going to set the actor location. to here shoot I know what I want to do I just don't know if I can do it yeah I'm gonna need the cube right is that what I did over here yeah Oh, I gotta cast it, don't I? Yeah. Er. Uh, we already know it's gonna be a pickup bowl. And then, uh, yeah, this is a uh, cube. Stop it. Yep. Yeah. Uh, set the collision response and then detach. But what I'm curious about is, yeah, see, it's gonna go to zero zero. Is the problem when I detach? <sighs> so again, this is not the way I would be doing this. But the, basically, we can detach. But when we detach, it goes to zero zero zero. And the problem is, once I detach it, I don't have a reference to that actor anymore. Because, oh, actually, I wonder if... If I, um... Set a reference to it before I do anything, will I still have a reference to it? Does it maintain the same thing? Let's find out. Okay. Let's delete this crap just so I don't confuse myself. Okay. So if it's detached and our new variable is going to be our um, detached actor. Detached. Uh, I guess that's right. Okay. We're going to grab a detached actor. We're going to set its uh, actor location to the pickwell actors world location this should set it let's see i can't unclick it anymore so that really doesn't help I managed to break detaching. Oh, I managed to break detaching because I didn't actually hook it up. There we go. Okay. So that will work. I can keep a reference to it. I thought it might work. Okay. Still not the way I would do this, but this is fun. Okay. So we've gone and set it, and let's go ahead and set our physics back. Seriously. Oh, it's still not cast. Okay, so to do cast to pick pick one object. Split it. Set collision on the response on all channels to block.
There we go. I got the clay, so I can, should be able to pick it up and move it. I can put it here. Its rotation is set to zero because that's what I told it to do. But it shouldn't screw me anymore. I can put it back here, and my collision still works. I can jump on it. And I'm guessing physics is turned off on this thing. Yeah, physics turned off, so... Go object. Let's see. Physics. Okay, let's see how this works. Yeah, see, so I'd have to disable physics. Let me pick it up, which is right here. And of course, doing this response to all channels is probably not the smartest thing. Um, see, whenever I start doing something, I don't like quarter assing it. Let's see. We want the pawn and to ignore the pawn. So hopefully that'll stop our exploding person issue. Oh, detach, set actor, collision. Okay, pawn, we'll turn pawn back to block. And then we go back to here. This is our cube and we'll set physics. Uh, enable, set simulate physics, there we go. And we're no longer gonna simulate physics. Here we will simulate physics, and I still need a target, so that doesn't help. There we go. Yay! Oh, I got there. Seriously, connect it. There we go. Okay, so we should have a cube that has physics. We should be able to pick it up, and move it. We should be able to drop it. There we go. Let's see if we can throw it. Whee! Yep, we can throw it. Click, and then we can go. Whee! Let's see if then we throw it up. Uh, it tumbles on the player. So there we go. That at least gives you something. Now, if you have, um, basically, all you'd have to do is uh, and keep on this set to an input action fire. I'm assuming you'd have it set up to maybe like a E for look or something, so your mouse and your interact buttons aren't funky like this. Um, you, this would basically be like your input action move, uh, input action, like, uh, interact or something. And then you'd have your mouse simply, um, you know, you have that pop up and I, I, I don't know at this point, this why this why I haven't done it yet. Obviously this is like the first half, but, um, let's see, YouTube, Unreal Engine, those are not Unreal Engine tutorials. This is what I was gonna go. I've already watched this once, and I've gotta basically steal the information from here because of how well done it was. Oh, live training! Here we go. Zach Parrish did a fantastic live training for a puzzle game. Which, of course, I have no idea what it was called or when it was. It was a puzzle game. Or even if... I don't even know if these are in order. A super tight puzzle. There we go. Yeah, these are definitely not in order. But here's a two-hour video Zach did making a 3D puzzle game. And the greatest part about this is if you look at it in action... Right here. Uh, that's not in action. Maybe it's where we start it. Let's see if we can start it. There we go. Yeah, let's let's watch him play it for a second. It's, which is technically right uh, in a little bit. Okay, let's let it play through. But he covers how to handle uh, spherical rotation using the mouse and like a touch input, which is pretty much what you're looking for—the ability to spin around an item and look at it. And uh, this is what I'm basically going to steal because he does a—he's got a really great way of handling it in here and yeah see so like see how you can just click and spin and move the item and it gives a little bit of force and friction that because that's pretty much what you, you want after you've picked it up so that's what I'm planning on that's the missing part basically you can take what I have implement this in here as well and you're done 
So, but yeah, um, and then I'll make a full tutorial on it, obviously, because why not? But um, yeah, this is, it's not a horrible amount of code. I'll just cover it again. Basically, once I hit something that was pick upable, I set the la actor location of that item to zero because we don't want it offset by our anchor. Then I went ahead and attached that item we hit to our anchor's location. So it attached it to there. Uh, by getting the root component of what we hit, so that way, because it's a blueprint, and then attached it to my pickle anchor, and boom, it was attached now. Then after that, of course, you could get, not of course, but we learned, you could get attached actors, and they'll give you all the attached actors, and we got the first one, we told it to no longer collide with our player, or else our player went ex flying off into midair, which is funny, and then I turned off physics. And then all we did was the opposite. So in the beginning, once we pushed our interact button, we checked to see if we had any actors already attached. If we did, well, we can, you know, um, maybe one attached, because we only want to keep one attached. So if someone was attached, we just get that person and detach them. Make sure we keep a reference to that person, so that way we can play with it a little bit later. And then tell that person to set its new location to the anchor. So it's basically exactly where it was, but now it's detached where it was instead of attached. Then we tell that detached actor again, we grab its cube object because it's set up like this to now block the pawn again and then to have physics turn back on. So it basically turns itself back on after we shut it off. And that gave us our pick up, move around, drop, and pick up, move around, and drop and kick so it's kind of like a square soccer ball and then all you would do is basically for the next thing is this is your input your action button instead of your um mouse fire button you know e for interact or whatever so the next thing you would do is take zach's code and implement it into your mouse movement code and you'd have it where you have it picked up and now the mouse movement code can simply do the same check here do we have anybody attached? If so, then we want our mouse movement code, or we well, basically, um, you know, we pick something up, we go over here, you know, show mouse cursor, mouse cursor, you know, make sure we can see our mouse cursor so now we can interact with our square. And then you do your a little bit of interact code somewhere in here. And then once you're done with it, hit your E button or whatever and it'll toss it. Yeah, but this gives you at least hopefully something to play around with to give you some ideas. Um, and that was fun to do. Um, okay. Uh, uh, do, do, do. Uh, a right light for an open world and sun like real sunshine. Um, hopefully it got passed along by Vanguard, but unfortunately that is something that I don't have much experience with because it's real world. But you have a... If you have um, in your default level, you have an atmospheric fog, which is that you know backgroundy color. You have your sky sphere, which is that cloudy stuff, and then technically you have your light source right here, which coincides with I want to say the fog. One of these two things is the sky sphere. Yeah, okay, so it's a sky sphere. The sky sphere itself hooks into your light source and it will color the scene based on the location of the light source, the rotation. So if your light source is rotated like that appropriately, it'll color things and you'll have, it should color, it's supposed to color. I know it's, oh, here we go. And you need to refresh the material. There we go. I knew it would color. It's not set auto refresh. Well, basically you have, based on your sky sphere sets your light like this. And the real sunshine, you can set it to go up and down based on the rotation of your light source. So if your light comes back out like it's supposed to, so it's pointing down, your sphere refreshes, now you have daylight. And all you would do is whenever the light source changes, whenever you rotate this, you tell the sky sphere to refresh itself. That's why it says update the sky material after moving directional light. And you can basically simulate sunset and sunrise. And if you notice your sun itself, see how it's up there? If we were to move our rotator light source, 
something like that, and then take our sky screen and refresh it, you'll notice your sun has now moved below the world, which is the correct rotation that we've set up for our light source. So yeah, look at this light source and look at the sky sphere. And yeah, if um okay, apparently we have a day night cycle posted. Um crap. For whatever reason, the stupid chat hold on. I can't pull out it auto turned that link into an image. There we go. I had to make it really big. Okay. Let's see. Um, give me a second, the Nick 385. In this code, can you figure out why the curve isn't affecting directional light intensity? Is there a curve in here somewhere? Oh, day-night curve. There we go. Get the float value from the curve based on the day length in minutes. And then set the intensity. Um, hmm. Grabbing the sun, setting its light component, and then use the curve just to get a float value. Um, have you tried outputting that get float value node to see what it actually tells you? I mean, are you actually getting a valid set of numbers from the your curve? It's about the only thing I can think of. Other than that, it looks fine. Um, I do know that intensity kind of blows to adjust because it really doesn't give you your expected result most of the time. Um, Nick, my friend has a problem with his pause menu. He gets stuck if he returns to the menu and play again. Why is that so? Um, I don't know. I don't know how your friend set up his pause menu. Um, I don't know exactly what you mean by he gets stuck. Let me not, let me pop back into here. Fine. But this pause menu gets stuck if he returns to the menu and plays again. Why is that so? I guess I'd have to have a little more information. I have um, a pause menu here I've done a video on. And, I mean, I can pull up the menu and close it and pull it up again and close it. And my character can move before and after. So is your character getting stuck if he closes the menu and he can't move anymore? Or, um, yeah, get stuck, okay, if it returns to the menu and plays again. Why is that so? So I'm guessing you mean like he pulls up the menu and then he can't move again here? It prevents him from moving once he gets back in here after the menu closes? And if you think that might be it, let me know. And, um... I can also just say, if you think that's what it is, at some point in time, your friend may be setting the input mode to allow him to... My guess is at some point he's setting the input mode away from the game, so maybe set input mode UI only. And when he's starting the game up, he's not setting the input back to game mode. Because you have to have it on game mode or game and UI in order for your mouse and your player input, your moving your character and your mouse rotation to work. He may not be having the input mode set properly. Without actually seeing how your code's set up or your actual flow, I couldn't give you a comment, uh, an exact answer. But generally, these are the nodes that will stop you from moving the input modes. Technically, your enable and disable input modes will do it as well. But most people don't know about these or use them. Most people use the input mode nodes to give the widget control over the mouse. So my guess would be it's one of these two things causing an issue. Besides that, I'm going to say, um, I think that's pretty much going to be done for the day. It's around noon. This is about when I stop after two hours. 
I was not able to record any videos yesterday because of uh, the game jam and me accidentally releasing two videos instead of one. So tonight I have uh, four, five, six, seven, eight videos to record, which is good. That at least cover me for the week. And then it will return tomorrow to doing stupid stuff, answering questions, stuff like that, whatever you feel like. Um, I'm going to do this at the end of every stream because if there's anyone who new who comes in, this is helpful. If you go to unrealslackers.org, it's a great way to get into the Discord chat. It's a web chat or a downloadable app or whatever you want, but it's full of, oh, you know what, I, there's no reason I can't just show you guys. Duh. It's full of people. We got a couple thousand people in there now. We have multiple channels. And there's nice things because it's broken down into sp specifics, like if you need help with blueprints or graphics. And then there's a general lounge channel where people hang out. But because there's so many people in here, it's a great chance to get some kind of real interactive help with other people. This is also where I hang out and try to help people and then also get ideas for stuff. The nice thing too is Epic Staff hangs out in here and there's some really nice people like the person who created the UI. He hangs out in the UI channel and will help people directly. So this is a great resource if you're looking for kind of some interactive help with Unreal Engine. Just go to that link I sent. Other than that, I will be off for the day. I'll be back again tomorrow. It'll be a short stream tomorrow because the official Epic stream kicks off after that. And I'll probably just be working on stupid, boring stuff tomorrow unless anyone has any questions. So just heads up on that. I kind of have, um, uh, I don't have a count. I don't have a count. Where's my count? I don't have a count. Seriously, I don't have a count. Okay, so 96 through 119. I have like 23 videos I need to create for Utilities Transform. Um, and the fun part is, once I get these done, then I'll be able to do the example that I was showing for James today. Um, because it uses these attaching and components. So these ones, ju just a heads up, these ones all are boring as hell. Setting locations, this stuff is boring, but it's still gotta be done. Um, but stuff like sockets will be fun because I can start showing how to attach stuff. And um, attaching is also like you just saw where you can attach to the camera, move it, and then drop it. I think I'm going to use that as the example actually uh, because I've already got it 90% done. So other than that, everyone have a good day or evening or whatever. And I'll see everyone whenever. And feel free to do whatever you want. Leave comments wherever you want. I will be around probably. Uh, if you can find the stop button, that is...